think this is the fourth time that we have Ron White here with us, and we are just honored each time even more. A graduate of UCLA and Princeton Theological Seminary, where he earned his PhD. He's a fellow today at the Huntington Library, a senior fellow of the Trinity Forum of Washington, D.C., and he's given hundreds of lectures on Lincoln uh, and Civil War, including at the White House, by the way. He's a winner of the Christopher Award, which salutes books that affirm the highest values of the human spirit. That's a testament. And we presume there'll be no Trump book coming in this series, right? <laughs> uh, he's the author, co-author, and editor of seven books, including Lincoln, a biography, Lincoln's greatest speech, the second inaugural, and the eloquent president, a portrait of Lincoln through his words. His latest book, whose inception I believe was here at our bookshop, is American Ulysses, Life of Ulysses S. Grant. It's a random house book, 826 pages and illustrated, and it's $35. You're going to like this book because it gives a totally new perspective on Mr. Grant, General Grant, President Grant. So you're going to hear a number of times through this show uh, the, that you've written biographies of both Lincoln and Grant, and we're going to begin to compare the two of them as we go through this a little bit, I, because you're one who has been in the minds of each of those uh, uh, presidents and wartime heroes. So I think that'll be an interesting to hear your perspective more than most. But let's start with his early life, because you did. And uh, it's interesting that you said that he did not like uh, reading biographies because most biographies did not give the formi formative years of the person that he's reading about. I think this is a book that Grant would read because you <laughs> give his formative years. And I wonder if it's because the internet was not available to those in the 20s, 30s, 8th, 19th century. They, how do they get to the early years? Today with the internet, that must have been a help to you. What besides that as well, but what were your major sources for his early years? Well, first to say, pick up on your comment, yes, Abraham Lincoln couldn't get back to his first generations of his family, so he didn't really know who they were. We do. Grant did know that and was very proud of it. I make the point that we might want to position him as the sort of prototype of the self-made man, but he didn't think of himself that way. He thought that this was a family story. And so he wanted to get back to the first Grants who came from England and settled originally in Massachusetts and then Connecticut and then slowly moving west. And there was a history of uh, Ohio written in the 1830s that tells a little bit of this story. So Grant wasn't completely sure of this. He was pretty sure that ancestors had fought in both the French and Indian War and the American Revolutionary War. And this gave, made him proud of his kind of military lineage. Mm -hmm. And so what were his early years like? Uh, how was he as a child, maybe, but at least certainly as a youth? Well, he grew up on the frontier, uh, born uh, in Point Pleasant, Ohio, grew up in Georgetown, which is about 55 miles east of Cincinnati. He was uh, given this name, Ulysses. The, his boyhood chums called him useless. <laughs> what, who would give a name like that? And it was a typical boyhood growing up fishing and hunting, except, and I think one, one of the things of writing biography is the notion of irony. He did not like using guns to hunt animals. He would not fire a gun on an animal, just like Abraham Lincoln would not. Mm -hmm. So in this very masculine frontier culture, this set him apart from his boyhood chums. So he lived there all the way till he was 17 until his father really said, I want you to go to West Point. It's a free education. It's engineering school, and I don't think he wanted to go, but in the days of the 19th century when your father or mother said something, he said, all right, if you wish, I will. Well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm going to ask you a Lincoln question right, <laughs> right now because right. of that. Yeah. Because there are some who have said that uh, Lincoln and his father, uh, his father wanted him to be a farmer, mm -hmm. till the land, mm -hmm. and he certainly didn't want to do that no. and fought against his father. Right. He didn't. Like, and some have said that he was like a slave, or he felt he was a slave mm -hmm. to his father because mm -hmm. he was put out to others to work to bring in money for the family. Do you, how do you see that relationship in that regard? Well, no, I think you're right. Uh, Lincoln did feel his father had taken advantage of him. 
that traditionally you would do that work and then you'd get a portion of it. We're not sure that Lincoln got any portion. So what you're suggesting is there was a conflict between Lincoln and his father and there was somewhat of a conflict between Grant and his father. His father was a tanner. It was an awful, smelly business. Grant couldn't stand it. And so he told his father, I'll do this until I'm 18 years of old age, but not one day longer. I do not want to be a part of this profession. I want to do something different. Was he a reader like Lincoln at this time? He time was a reader. And, and we know his father was a reader, oh. self-taught reader, not an educated reader. And so Grant was also a reader. When Grant went to West Point, he finished 21st out of 39 in his class. So earlier biographers have sometimes suggested that Grant was kind of an intellectual lightweight. But in his memoirs, he said, I must apologize. Why would he apologize? He said, I spent my time reading novels. And then he told us all the novels, all the authors that he read. Mm -hmm. Why did he apologize? Well, I spent a week at West Point, and I learned that novels were kind of trashy in those days, and the West Point Library really didn't have novels in their collection. So what did he learn from West Point, if not novels? Well, West Point was basically an engineering school, and people graduated without really much of an obligation to serve in the military. It was the time of the railroads, and people like George McClellan and others quickly moved from the military to the railroads where there was money to be made. Mm -hmm. And Grant thought perhaps he would teach mathematics. Maybe he would come back and teach at West Point or at some nearby college. He wasn't too sure of the military career even when he graduated. Really, even when he graduated, he was not sure what he was going to He's do. He's not completely sure. He was posted to Jefferson Barracks by St. Louis, which was the largest barracks in America. This is where people were posted to be going west. My and father was there as well, as really? posted to go to uh, Europe, although he didn't go there. Oh, okay. So he fell into this life, and then, of course, within several years, he fought in the war with Mexico, and this changed him forever. We have to remember that, uh, that, that West Point was not necessarily uh, a prized institution in its first years. Americans were very afraid of a standing army. They had watched how a standing army in France had been a part of overthrowing the French government. So West Point didn't have the kind of prestige that we think of today. But it began to gain that prestige, obviously, in the war with Mexico because of their gallantry and what they had done. Um, let me go back to a moment for the, the Grant Papers. Yes. And we'll get into these other yes. things as well again. Uh, you're the first to use the Grant Papers in its entirety. I am. That must have been a boon. It really was, because uh, way back in the 1930s, there was an American presidency series, and a distinguished professor from the University of Wisconsin, William Heseltine, wrote a biography of Grant in which he lampooned Grant, said Grant was not a writer, was not a reader, and we don't even have his papers. Well, the papers began to be collected in 1962 at Southern Illinois University Press, I never had the privilege of meeting John Simon, the editor, who yep. you knew. Yep. But well, I think he started I started out as a uh, a book boy here at the mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln. Did, did he really? He okay. did, yeah. But I think I met him every day because it is the most wonderfully edited and annotated papers. So now we have 32 volumes that have been published, and the final 33rd volume will be published next year, which will be Grant's memoirs. So I had the opportunity to consult all of the volumes for my biography. So until then. You're going to have to go to the Webster edition of <laughs> Grant's memoirs, which we have behind uh -huh. the entire set that mm -hmm. uh, Charles Webster uh, produced, mm -hmm. called the Shoulder Strap Set. Uh -huh. And uh, the memoirs, of course, uh, of Grant are known to be, uh, I'm not sure which one to put first. Eisenhower and Grant, unlikely presidents, most would think, mm -hmm. have the finest memoirs of their war years, crusade yes. in Europe, and then this one, yes. than any other president. So he knew how to write. And what I love about reading this as well, I'm, I can read what his, his orders were like. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when I compare Grant and Lee and their orders, you could drive a Mack truck through Lee's, right. but not Grant, right. and it shows in his writing. Well, and Grant, because he finished 21st out of 39 at West Point, people didn't think of him as a writer. But we know that great writers are invariably great readers. And so through the prism of the memoirs, we go back to find what you just described, that actually Grant's orders were very well written, very economical, very action verbs. No one could misunderstand. 
And so we have a whole new appreciation of Grant. And I sort of ask in my biography, well, if he could write this great memoir at the end of his life, did we miss something along the way? Did we miss what he read? Did we miss what he wrote? And I think that's a story that needed a fuller explanation. And we did. We did. We, we did miss a great deal, yeah. And it's here in your book, which is uh, <laughs> open for everyone now to be able to read and understand Grant in a new light. Mm -hmm. uh, since we're talking about memoirs, uh, I'm hopping around here, but uh, that's how it's going to be. Sherman's memoirs, we just had James McDonough oh. in for his book a couple of weeks ago yes, on yes. Sherman. Yes. And Sherman also wrote his memoirs, and as we learned in here, was not a bad writer himself. Right. And did read as well. It was, uh, that's something that surprised me a bit, uh, how extensive a writer Sherman really was. Mm -hmm. And if any two books go together, it's your Grant book and McDonough's Sherman <laughs> book because it goes back and forth. I was so happy to have read one after the other, mm -hmm. and I would advise everyone to do that <laughs> because they just go together, and if you're going to give Christmas gifts, <laughs> this would be a great duo to give any historian. So tell us about uh, how you feel Sherman and Grant compare as memoirists. Well, Grant was not going to write his memoirs. He felt that memoirs were self-serving, they were settling scores, and he actually was not terribly pleased with Sherman's memoirs, which he felt did some of that. It's fascinating to think that in Dwight Eisenhower's two terms as President of the United States, there was only one memoir written by a cabinet member. Just think of how many memoirs were written in the George Bush administration or the Barack Obama administration before the administration's even finished. And they're often tell-all, this is my point of view, you, uh, you were wrong, I was right. But then when Grant uh, lost his money in Wall Street in a Ponzi scheme, uh, he was approached first by the Century Magazine, who wanted him to write four articles, which he did, and they were very successful. And then they offered him $10,000 to write his memoirs. Well, Mark Twain heard about this, and he rushed over to Grant's house, and as Mark Twain would say in his own language, offering Grant $10,000 was like offering an unknown Comanche to write his memoirs. And he offered Grant 70% of the proceeds to write his memoirs. But then Grant became uh, diagnosed with throat cancer. And as I tell of the story, in his final campaign, it was a race against death to write this incredible memoir. His doctors believed he only lived as long as he did because of the task of completing the memoirs. Oh, yes. They really are remarkable. Many people have that. If they, yeah. they know that they're dying, right. they live longer for to be there for Christmas, yes. for instance. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Be with family or something. He did the same with memoir. I once had a letter <clears throat> that uh, Sherman, that Grant wrote to uh, uh, Battles of Leaders, the Century uh, Company, yes. saying that I just finished the Shiloh chapter. Right. It was two weeks prior to his death. Yes. And of course, uh, he never saw the published word right, that Grant right, did. Right, right, yeah. Uh, in fact, we have, how many times do we have people come, I ask my staff, that people are uh, calling us, we have a signed copy of Grant's <laughs> memoirs. I say, well, that's invaluable since it's from the grave. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, did you, do you know where that uh, inscription is? Did you come across that in the papers? To the soldier, he dedicates it to the soldiers and sailors of the Civil War, and it's in every copy, of course. Yes, said. yes, yes, yes. Did, did you come across that by chance? I did, yeah, yeah. Where is it lying today? I'm trying to think where it's lying. I'll have to uh, think well, about that. Well, later on, and yep. we'll let you all know right, right. where to go there, because I would like to see this. Give us an idea of his personality. What was he like, uh, and did that change through his, his life? Well, Grant was a... First of all, he was, had the uh, nickname or, of, of a, the quiet man, or some called him the Sphinx. And I puzzled for a long time what this meant. And finally, I read a book a couple of years ago by Susan Cain on, in, she was an introvert. And I came to the conclusion that Grant was an introvert. And I don't use that in any depreciating way. By that, I meant when he would have a conflict with Andrew Johnson, he would say to him, I don't wish to respond to you right now. Give me a day or two and I'll write you a letter. So Grant was not a good public speaker, as was Lincoln, but he was a wonderful writer. He was a good listener. He would con conduct cabinet meetings, and he would not say very much at first. He wanted everybody else to speak. I found his most compelling quality was what I would call self-effacement. He did not put himself forward. He told Sherman, 
wrote Sherman after he was elected president, I was forced into it in spite of myself. I had to step forward. If the values of the last war were to be carried forward, it couldn't be left to a trading politician, he liked that term, of either the Republican or Democratic Party. Someone had to step forward, and I guess it had to be me. Mm -hmm. What a remarkable quality. Well, let me get back to what I started out with, with Lincoln and Grant sure, together. Sure, sure. Um, because you write that both of them had capacity for self-improvement. Yes. Self-effacing in their yeah, stories. Right. Both wrote well. Mm -hmm. And both were strong but gentle. Yes. Um, before I ask that question, I'm going to actually put a quick footnote in here. Do we have to give Eisenhower a pass then for saying that uh, he had to think to, uh, about Nixon and what might be his uh, best uh, traits and, and how he helped the administration. Remember, he, he said that right, right. about Nixon when he was asked, and, no, I'll have to come back to you on that. Mm -hmm. Maybe he was uh, a better writer as well than Oh, I think so, yeah. He, he was not a person who was going to speak right off the top of his head. No, just like Grant. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. what, going back to Lincoln and Grant, what traits did they share? What made them different? What brought them close together? Well, I think one trait that they shared, and it comes out in the remarkable first two days of the Overland Campaign in May of 1864, where Grant walks, leads his troops into the wilderness, and the enemy becomes not the Confederates, but the wilderness, where in this scrub forest where daylight can barely break through, uh, cavalry is impracticable, artillery is useless, and even though Grant has a, a twice the advantage in, in man, manpower, at the end of the second day, there's 18,000 federal casualties. The Confederates have taken down the telegraph wires. We need to get a note, a, a message to Lincoln, who's sitting in the telegraph office wondering what's going on. So finally, uh, one of the correspondents offers $1,000 to anybody who will get through, and young Henry Wing, 24 years of age, takes... The, the charge and does get through, but he asks Grant, what's the message? What can I tell President Lincoln? And it's a simple six-word message. We will not turn back. And when Lincoln gets that message, he turns to one of his aides and says, if any other general had been the, at the head of this army, we would have been once more back across the Rapidon, back in another retreat to uh, Washington. But Grant has, and I love Lincoln's word, he has pertinacity. And uh, the word is determination. Both of these men had a determination, a kind of, I call it an internal moral compass. Grant called it moral courage. And this is what Lincoln admired in Grant and what Grant admired in Lincoln. Pertinacity. Interesting. Yeah. Love, the, love the word. I'm showing a, uh, a lithograph we have. Mm -hmm. Uh, of Grant at Massaponix Church. Right. And of course, uh, this is well known where he was sitting on pews that were taken out of the church with mm -hmm. his uh, staff. And he's seen later on over a pew where he's uh, looking at a uh, map. Mm -hmm. And it's from photographs that were mm -hmm. uh, taken mm -hmm. at the time yes. from the church. And so the last attack at Cold Harbor is one of the great mistakes that Grant admitted to making. Yes. How did Grant's reputation suffer from making that mistake? Oh, it suffered terribly. The whole notion of the lost cause that quickly was generated at the end of the Civil War cast uh, the North as winning only because of its numerical superiority of the great, greater industrial might and of Grant the Butcher. And when Grant the Butcher is invoked why the, the, the battle at Cold Harbor is invoked. And here we have 7,000 casualties within 20 minutes, for which Grant apologized. But nevertheless, that, that's the image that some wanted to carry forward, not even asking the question, well, how many casualties did Robert E. Lee in, endure at Cold Harbor? Well, let's talk about Grant and Lee. Uh, yeah. Grant was known as the Butcher. Is that a fair assessment when you consider the two of them? It isn't. It, it, it persisted for years, but in recent decades, uh, Jim McPherson, other Civil War historians have pointed out that Grant's casualties were actually less than Lee's casualties. Grant, in most situations, would much rather take prisoners. He did not want to kill other people. This was, this was, 
But yet he was willing to persist in what, he, what was called a hard war, a hard war followed by a soft peace. So yes, it was a very bloody campaign in the Virginia Overland campaign. And he was always, always ready to say or think that better to fight now than later. That's right. Better to fight now than later. If we wait later, the, 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 the casualties are only going to be higher. They're going to become higher. Yeah. Uh, we have a question. If you're going to send in a question, please hmm. uh, give us your name so we can shout out and say hello to you. Uh, there's a long-running rumor, myth, that Mark Twain ghost wrote or heavily edited Grant's memoirs. Is there any evidence for this? Certainly, uh, Charles Webster was Twain's, uh, Clemens' father-in-law, mm -hmm. correct? And didn't he bring the memoirs to Webster? Twain did not ghostwrite the memoirs. Twain was living often in these months in Hartford. He would come by train into New York to visit his publishing office. And uh, in fact, Grant actually complained to his son Fred that he wished he would have gotten more advice from Web from Twain or more just what's going on. And when Twain heard this, he rushed over to tell him. He said, your memoirs are wonderful. He said, they compare to Julius Caesar's memoirs. Hmm. I'm sorry if I've not told you this, but I've thought this all the way along. So there's no possibility that Grant wrote, Twain wrote these memoirs. But again, it's fascinating how these myths get going and persist. Uh, I have a number of things I want to show yes. here and there because we're able to do this. We're at an antiquarian bookshop that mm -hmm. specializes mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. in this area. And uh, you can all, everyone here can come to our bookshop and, and see some of these on our website. This is something that we just got in hmm. that uh, is uh, Grant getting a replacement horse. Hmm. And I should have written this down so I could say what it is. But he's saying that it's one captured horse to be used as private property, having just been disabled, uh, all my private horses brought with me uh, in the field. So U.S. Grant, Major General, this is December 30th of 62. Mm -hmm. So he was a horseman. He was a marvelous horseman. And he had many horses. Many right? horses. And Cincinnatus was yes, one. Yes, right, right. And I will, I'd love to find out which one this was. Yes. Probably won't know. And he would ride he'd have three or four horses at all times. And we don't live in that kind of culture, but for people of the 19th century, when they knew that Grant was a kind of a person who gentled horses, they, that elevated their respect for him. This was the kind of person that they deeply admired. Uh, the story is told that Grant, uh, one of his aides said, Grant sort of eschewed traveling on roadways or highways he just would, he could ride for hours across country and, and just tirelessly on horses. Well, uh, what do they say that uh, if horses like you, then the man can be trusted? Is That's that, right. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, here was a political war. There ever was a political mm -hmm. war, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and numerous political generals came in. How? First of all, what was Grant's politics, if he had them? Uh, was he engaged in politics and what was going on around him before the war and during it? And then how did he deal with all these political generals that surrounded him? Well, Grant, for the longest time, was very non-political. He voted, actually, in 1856 for James Buchanan, not because he liked Buchanan, but he didn't like Fremont. He thought Fremont was very egotistical. We're not even sure he voted in 1860. As a military person, he was deferential to civilian leadership and very appreciative of Abraham Lincoln in that regard. And only after the war did he become more involved with politics. He set up his headquarters, unlike McClellan, away from Washington. So he would not have to become embroiled in the political conversation about the war. He respected the fact that Lincoln as president and as commander in chief was setting the policy for the war. It was his task to be involved in operations and tactics. And the funniest thing that happened was, as Lincoln grew to trust Grant, he would say to Grant, don't tell me what you're going to do. I can't keep secrets. I can't keep <laughs> secrets. He trusted Grant to do what was right. But he said, don't tell me. <laughs> I like that. So how did he assess, uh, so he had the political generals around him. Yes. So how did he assess them and their abilities? Did he treat them any differently if they didn't do well? Did he buck political trends? 
Well, first of all, many West Pointers were very disdainful of the volunteers who were the majority of the army. Grant was not. He respected the volunteers. He was aware that m many of the generals uh, were political generals. I mean, Lo John Logan, Ben Butler, John McLaren. And he got along with most of them, not with McLaren. And uh, he, he, he judged them by how they would do in the field. And so you have someone like John Logan of Illinois, a politically appointed general, but who became a very, very good general. And in that regard, uh, Grant respected him. At one point, he was about to replace George Thomas with John Logan. So he didn't simply as as say, as many others did, well, you're a political general, you're a volunteer, therefore, no, he would judge them on their merits. Yeah. So uh, the same thing, of course, with the regular as well. Yes. How did he assess, by the way, in general, the generals on opposing side that he saw through the war? Did he give assessments of them? He did. One of the remarkable things of his world tour which he took after his retirement from the presidency was John Russell Young, a New York correspondent, went with him and engaged Grant in all these kind of conversations as they sat on two deck chairs. And unlike many other memoirs, Grant was extremely uh, positive and appreciative. He was appreciative of McClellan in these memoirs. I think he thought Joe Johnston was probably the best Confederate general, better than Lee. He didn't demean Lee, but he thought that perhaps Lee's reputation was a little bit overweening to who he actually was. Mm -hmm. And then he gave his assessment of his own generals. Of course, we know he did not like William Rosecans. He thought he was not a good general. But he was very uh, tried to point out first the uh, qualities that he liked in a general before he would then maybe offer a criticism. I just turned up a letter, mm -hmm. actually just this morning, okay. from Elihu Washburn. Oh, yes from Galena. This is uh, not from there. This is uh, uh, a letter that's in 64 in May from Washington. Now, he, Grant, had a cabal of generals that came out of Galena with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, Washburn, of course, was there. And how did he, Grant, uh, Washburn, help Grant politically going into the war, maybe beforehand as well, and certainly afterward? What was his relationship with Grant? He helped him enormously. He was the early champion and advocate of Grant. After the Battle of Belmont, he brought uh, to Lincoln the attention of Grant. After the Battle at Fort Donelson, Washburn would sometimes travel with Grant in the field. And so he was continually reporting to Lincoln, who he had a close relationship to, uh, how Grant was doing and how successful he was. Lincoln had a habit or a policy of wanting to meet his generals, either visiting them in the field or asking them to come to the White House. Well, obviously, he couldn't do that with Grant. Grant was, in a sense, way out west. So he had to rely on others, uh, Washburn being one. Uh, uh, Edwin Stanton sent Charles Dana out as Assistant Secretary of War almost to be a spy on Grant to assess who is Grant. Several people came to assess Grant, and they all came back with very positive assessments, which engendered a greater and greater confidence in Lincoln of Grant. Hmm. Uh, well, then what about the infamous General Order Number 11? Yes. How do you assess that, and how did Lincoln assess that if he was trying to think of uh, Grant as going to the East later? Well, I like Sarna's book, When Grant Expelled the Jews. I think it's a wonderful book. Uh, Julia called it that obnoxious order. And, uh, it it order came up in, later for the presidency It as did. Well. Oh, it did. It did, yeah. So in December of 1862, uh, other generals had also been complaining, first of all, about the traitors. Grant thought we were having a double policy. That in, from Washington, Sam and Chase was trying to promote trade, and Grant said, oh my goodness sakes, by promoting trade, you're only helping the Confederates. They're able to resupply themselves. So he complained about the traitors, but Jews were a major part of the traitors, so he complained about them, and he offered this order. Now behind that is a kind of a personal story. And the story is that his father, who was always trying to take advantage of his son's prominence, had been made the agent, really, for a company in Cincinnati that was uh, with Jewish backers who was also involved in trading. So he was just furious with his father that he was a part of this trading. But when Lincoln heard of this order, why, he abrogated it, rescinded it. 
Now, Sarna's book is so fascinating because he then tells the later story that Grant becomes deeply repentant for what he had done, and that as Sarna tells the story, Grant will appoint many Jewish leaders to, to prominent positions in his administrations as president. He will visit synagogues, he will reach out to Jewish leaders, and they reach back to him. Mm -hmm. Well, that so, was a, a and, and part of this story to me is, do you learn from your mistakes? This was a huge mistake, but do you learn from it? Mm. And he did. He did. We mentioned the Battle of Belmont. Uh, he had his ups and downs there. He did. So what did he, how did Belmont help develop him militarily? Well, he, he executed a surprise attack on Belmont. I wish we could see Belmont today. I tried to see it several years ago. It's mostly underwater mm. as the Mississippi River has changed its course. But what Grant failed to do was to consider the fact, once he had executed a surprise attack, how the Confederates might respond from across the river. And as his men were exulting in what they had accomplished, the Confederates came across the river and, and attacked Grant's men, and he barely escaped. But there's the remarkable story that all of them had been on the boat, and then Grant wanted to be the last man to execute the, they, this retreat, and he was spied by several Confederates at the top of this hill. There's a man. Somehow they didn't fire on him. Grant came down that hill, got that horse to come down the plank, got on the boat, and got away. But he learned from that. And that, I think that's a huge part of military stra strategy. Do you learn again from your mistakes? Would he again be more watchful of how others might respond to his attacks? He had that capacity, he did. Then, like Lincoln, he did. to grow, yes. learn, and yeah. produce. Yes. Well, um, I'm going to read this uh, question that just came in, mm -hmm. and I'm going to read it now so that uh, the author of it can uh, get out to dinner. Because <laughs> this is uh, Angela in Germany. And oh, we thank you for thank uh, you. being with us, Angela, and we'll see you in November in Gettysburg. Dear Mr. White, you just mentioned that what Lincoln and Grant appreciated in each other was pertinacity, and I was wondering why Grant, in his original biography, would only mention this as a side note. Would not at the time Grant wrote his biography it be a topic to the public would be interested in? Why in general was Grant so restrained talking about Lincoln? Good question, Angela. Thank you. Well, thank you, Angela, for your question. I, I'm not sure I would agree that Grant was restrained. I mean, in his memoirs, he says uh, Grant will be remembered as the great conspicuous figure of this war. He is the greatest figure of the war and, and offers this undaunted praise of, of Lincoln. And uh, if you're suggesting Grant was often not verbose in his language, well, that might be so, but of all the kind of word portraits in the memoirs, and there are many, I would say that the greatest word portrait is of Lincoln. No. Yeah, we'll have to reread that, Andrew. That's all there is to it. Uh, Norval, who uh, is always with us, and we appreciate it, Norval, thank you, uh, asked a question about the Indians. Uh, because, well, first of all, does Mr. White discuss the Indian problems that Grant encountered, or those uh, of Orville Grant. Uh, so he was, I learned in here, that he was the first president in his inaugura inauguration to uh, champion Indian rights. And that's a, a wonderful thought that he could get that far, because he didn't start that way, did he? Well, the, the, his two terms as presidency, I, I argue, have been kind of overwhelmed by the scandals of the second term, so we haven't taken full note of the accomplishments of both terms. I was surprised in reading his first inaugural address that he literally says, we have to rethink the Indian policy. He had traveled west. He didn't campaign in 1868, but he took a trip west all the way out to Colorado. He'd been in California. He'd been in Oregon. When Julia wrote him, his wife Julia wrote him when he was stationed in Oregon, she said, I'm terribly afraid you're riding alone in the forests of Oregon. The Indians are going to get you. And he writes back and says, the Indians are not going to get me. He says, these are the most gentle people you could ever imagine. The only problem the Indians have are the white settlers. So he had come to the conclusion that the problem was not the Indians, but the settlers, which put him at odds with both Sherman and Sheridan. So what would he do about that inaugural question or promise? 
he very quickly convened a group of, of leaders, actually first Quakers, then leaders of various Protestant denominations, and then Catholics, and said to them, I need your help in readdressing this problem, and perhaps your mission boards can promote or nominate some people to become a new class or core of Indian agents. So he really did address this problem. Well, I'm going to go back here to the presidency a little bit. Right. Uh, he had a gift for quiet leadership, military yes. leadership yes. personally. If he had such a success with his staff and the generals under him during the war, why did this not translate into the presidency? What went wrong in the presidency that he couldn't have the same sort of leadership he had in wartime? Well, I think this Where do you think he did? Well, I think this is one of the great uh, contradictions of Grant's presidency. How do you understand what you said so well, someone who really was a very good judge of character and ability in the military, but somehow did not have carry over that ability? So he had his own aides, Orville Babcock, for example, who had been very faithful to him, but it seems was corrupted by Washington corrupts. And then he had members of his own cabinet who he perhaps didn't know as well as the generals who served under him, and they also became corrupt. No one ever accused Grant himself of being corrupt. What they accused him of was not keeping his eye on the ball, not being shrewd enough to understand what these people were doing behind his back, and then sadly sometimes defending them when they really couldn't be defended. This is one of the real enigmas of the Grant presidency. Well... Then another enigma that comes up to me when I'm thinking about this is what happened at Grant's funeral. Yes. And here is a spectacular mm -hmm. book oh, that was produced mar for the funeral, uh, after the funeral, mm -hmm. to be placed into public areas. Mm -hmm. They had a beautiful brass stand mm. that they could put in the lobby of a, of a public area and show photographs of the room that he died in, the funeral train, the funeral itself in, uh, in uh, New York. And here just to show what it looks like on the inside. I'll stand up with this. Yes. There's the funeral train and I'm getting ready to go to the funeral. And we've taken some photos of uh, others that are in here. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing book mm -hmm. that uh, really as you go through it, you see something that you don't expect. And yes. that is, especially today, mm -hmm. Because of what happened, especially in the last, uh, the second uh, presidency of, mm -hmm. of Grant, that he's now, he's been excoriated for that mm -hmm. and put down for that. Yes, he helped save the Union, but then mm -hmm. the degradation of the presidency. Right. But that's not what happened at the time. No. The people there came out in droves, as you can see in these photographs. They thought that he was, he was somewhat above the politics, perhaps, that that took part of his presidency down. They admired him greatly. Talk to me about this dichotomy. It's hard, perhaps, for us to understand, looking backwards, that Grant could be, at the one hand, criticized for the scandals of his second term, but retain such amazing popularity. So at Grant's death, as this phenomenal volume tells the story, there was a seven-mile funeral march there were a million five hundred thousand people that came to, to the funeral. Uh, five hundred thousand came from outside the city of New York. And most amazing at all, and I, when I tell audiences this, they're so surprised, was the pallbearers riding together in a carriage, the two leading Union generals, Sherman and Sheridan, and the two leading living Confederate generals, Joe Johnston and Simon Bolivar Buckner. The four of them riding together symbolically saying, together we are celebrating Grant. Now the country was still coming apart, you know, in terms of North and South, but Grant was a unifying figure, and that funeral procession was a unifying event. It's interesting you mentioned Buckner. Buckner was a bunkmate of Grant in Mexico, right. in the Mexican War. Right. And he was there, the third general in, in, the, in the line. Yeah. He had to surrender to Fort Donaldson yes. to Grant. To and I once had that letter. That oh. He wrote a beautiful letter to Grant. Mm -hmm. I'm ready, Victorian in scope. Mm -hmm. I'm ready to give up my sword. What are the terms? And, mm -hmm. and you know what Grant said. What did Grant say? And he said, the only terms are unconditional surrender. So here is Buckner, and he was really mortified by he that. Was. He His was. friend right. saying that. Yes. Yet 
they, they got together when he was writing the memoirs. He went up to Albany, and he became a pallbearer. So that's something for both Buckner and Grant, positive to think about. Buckner had become quite a remarkable figure after the war, newspaper editor, governor of Kentucky. And in, in Grant's final weeks, uh, Buckner traveled up to Mount McGregor by Saratoga Springs. By then, Grant could no longer speak, and they exchanged communication as Grant would write notes to Buckner. And when Buckner was asked by newspapermen, what did Grant say? He said, I'm not going to tell you. This was a private conversation, and Grant then heard about this. He said, you're very free to say whatever you want to say. And he said, I simply wish to say that I came to represent the people of the South and their deep admiration for Grant, who is the hero of Appomattox. He had offered these magnanimous peace terms to Lee and therefore the people of the South. Um, we got two more questions yes. that have come in from uh, our uh, watchers out there. We appreciate your being uh, live with us on, on this program. Uh, so. Here is one from Maurice Jeffries, and each of these actually is about his relationship with another general. Mm -hmm. So Maurice Jeffries asks, what is your take on Grant's relationship with George Thomas? An interesting relationship. And the other, I'm, I wish you had given your name, what was Grant's opinion of Robert E. Lee as a general in person? So Thomas and Lee, both out of Virginia. Yes, well, George Thomas, who often was compared to George Washington. He was a straw, tall, six feet, two and a half inch person, rugged individual. Grant had a mixed opinion of Thomas. On the one hand, uh, he was, Thomas was the rock of Chickamauga who had stood when the forces of the Federal Army were being decimated. On the other hand, he had the nickname Old Slow Trot. And at times, Grant would be kind of really upset that Thomas didn't seem to move, didn't seem to act, but he never could quite bring himself to remove Thomas because he understood the tremendous courage of him. So he respected him for his courage, and, and that, I think, was the enduring value. In terms of Robert E. Lee, he respected Robert E. Lee in his memoirs, though you, you get the sense that maybe, again, Joe Johnston might have been the one who he admired more than Lee. Because I think it, part of that was that Lee had this kind of almost over-the-top reputation, and Grant, who's never really critical of anybody, uh, sort of says, well, maybe, maybe that isn't completely deserved. Yeah. How about Henry Halleck? Uh, again, no name. Always give your name. We want to, we'd like to be able to say hello to you and, and where you're from. First name is okay. What was Grant's relationship with Halleck, Henry Halleck? Again, an ambiguous relationship. Uh, Halleck. They were both out east, uh, out west. Out west, for a while. they were. And, and Halleck was called Old Brains, and he had written a book on military theory. And, but many of the people in the field thought he was a desk general rather than a battlefield general. So when Halleck took his position in St. Louis, Grant wanted to come and see him and talk things over, and Halleck said, Not now. And when he finally went to see Halleck, things didn't go too well. So Halleck seemed at first to be not sure whether Grant really had this ability. And after, uh, in the early weeks and months of the war, a conversation took place that Grant didn't know about between Halleck and McClellan. How was Grant doing? Should they remove him? Grant learned of this after the war, and Halleck therefore is conspicuously absent in the memoirs. However, Grant, Halleck then became uh, general-in-chief, and when Lincoln appointed General, Link, Grant to that position, what would be the role of Halleck? Well, very generously, Grant asked Halleck if he would become the kind of uh, second in command, a, a whole new position created, the administrative person in Washington. And they worked together very well. Mm -hmm. He was a good administrator. Grant was the, obviously the person who could direct operations in the field. And Halleck was ready to be under Grant at that time. He was time. ready to be under Grant. He, 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 he had re recognized that Grant deserved the appointment that he received from Lincoln. Well, someone else who improved and grew. Yeah, right? that's right. Yeah. Um, John Sampson from St. Louis. Thank you, John, for this question, ah. uh, one that everyone thinks about when you think of Grant. Determining the truth about Grant's alcohol consumption mm -hmm. has always been difficult due to the influence of army gossip and largely unfounded accusations by army rivals and political enemies. What is your opinion on his alcohol issue? Well, John, I like the way you pose the question because I think part of the problem is exactly what you say. 
army gossip and, uh, and, and rivalry. You know, why does Grant, in the eyes of his contemporaries, deserve to rise so quickly when others have a more senior ranking? I think there's no doubt that Grant was involved at times in drinking. That was part of his demise at Fort Humboldt where he offered his resignation. Uh, I don't think he was an alcoholic. I don't think he was a drunkard. The story has been often told that when he was away from Julia and fell into despair, this is when the drinking took place. One reason it's been suggested that he wanted Julia near him, and it's remarkable, in the middle of this terrible war going on, she was with him a great deal of the time. When she was with him, then the drinking was no longer a problem. Give us a quick assessment of their marriage. We just found out in McDonough's book uh, on Sherman just how, how valuable Ellen was to William Tecumseh Sherman. What about Julia? What was their relationship and what was the value that she gave to him? I'm smiling because I, I try to lift her up in my biography. I think she's been marginalized, kind of sidelined unfairly. Uh, they had a remarkable relationship, uh, smitten of each other from the very beginning, uh, a tremendously wonderful marriage. A few years ago, someone approached me about doing a television miniseries, and the person said, tell me some of the great qualities that you think in Grant. And one of the first things I said was, well, they had a wonderful marriage, and the person shook his head and said, that will never do. That will never do in a television miniseries. <laughs> but they did. People saw them holding hands at City Point holding hands in, the West, in West Point. She was a much more a social being than he was. And so in the receptions at the White House, as he was sometimes a little awkward in personal relationships, I, I said earlier he was an introvert, she was wonderful in these relationships. And so they formed a great partnership, sometimes almost opposites attract. She wasn't a beautiful woman physically, but she was beautiful in what counts. She was vivacious. She was generous. She was gentle. And, and therefore, they just had a marvelous marriage. This is why I'm touting this book on Sherman, <laughs> because we learn about Ellen in here mm -hmm. and Julia in your book. Yes. And the two together really help the man, mm -hmm. the yes. man. Yes, yes. And that's why I think these really, in a way, go together uh, in a very positive manner. Uh, we're having uh, another book come in that also, strangely enough, is tangential to both uh, Grant and Sherman, mm -hmm. and that's uh, Noah Trudeau, Andy Trudeau's come, new book. So I want to talk about City Point for a moment. Yes. I'll put it over here as I've been instructed by the <coughs> technical crew. Um, because it also brings about uh, reconstruction. On December 3rd, Andy's coming in on a book about uh, that greatest journey, and that is to City Point. And I really want to ask you how you view this conference through the eyes of Grant, Lincoln, and Sherman. Do they agree later on, especially Grant and Sherman, in their memoirs? Trudeau writes, and I want to ask you this as well at the same time, it would be wrong to think Lincoln imprinted himself upon Grant's thinking. It would be closer to the truth to say that Lincoln's strong moral core and flexible tactics toward achieving peace validated Grant's own inclination in that direction. Grant understood, like Lincoln, that the true measure of victory would be in the promises kept. Do you agree with this assessment? I, I like that very much. This is the first time I've heard it because what he's suggesting is the traditional story is that Grant took his cue from Lincoln and therefore Grant's magnanimous peace terms offered at Appomattox were really in response to this conference at City Point. But what he's suggesting is that no... I mean, obviously Lincoln did offer that point of view, but that Grant already within himself had the same point of view, and therefore they were kind of simpatico in the way this would work out. And when Grant arrives at, at Appomattox, in some ways having not really thought through what he was going to do, and Lee tells him, don't you think we better get on to it? He simply writes down uh, the peace terms, which are very magnanimous. Yes, I, I like that point of view, yeah. So how did they view Reconstruction then? Uh, uh, Hobbit Sherman and Grant in their memoirs, did they view it looking back to Lincoln or did they go forward under their own experiences? Well, before the war was over, the query had gone out to both Sherman and Grant. What did they think should be the view for Reconstruction? And for whatever reason, Grant didn't answer, but Sherman did. And Sherman took a pretty tough line. 
he had been in Louisiana. He, he was not at all sure about these folk. And when Grant read Sherman's response, then he wrote his response. And he was much more, I would say, in the camp of Lincoln, much more willing to offer a conciliatory approach to Reconstruction. That was where he began. Now, he didn't end up there as the Confederates, he felt, were taking advantage of his magnanimity in, in Reconstruction. But his basic posture would have been conciliatory, and knowing that many Republicans did not share Lincoln's conciliatory attitude towards Reconstruction. Well, author's voice uh, is for the world. We bring authors to you, to the world. And we had just had Angela from Germany watching us. Mm -hmm. And uh, we may have had a question from New Jersey. So we're, we're international here. So here is Mark Morden from Ottawa, Canada. Mm -hmm. Could you describe the complexity of Grant's relationship and opinion of Custer? Thank you for signing my book. Thank you for ordering a book. Makes a great gift to your other Canadians. Well, we often, we often have thought of Custer only with a little bighorn, and we haven't sort of seen Custer and his role in the Civil War. Uh, Custer was, uh, you might, whether headstrong is too, 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 too strong a comment. He was a young, talented uh, uh, person willing to take the initiative. And I think Grant, with Custer as with others, was Sheridan would be another example, was willing to sort of say, all right, I understand this, and I'm not going to try to rein these people in. I, I appreciate what, what they're doing, and we'll try to work with them. It's a question I've asked a few others that have sat in this chair. Uh, it's the politician versus the soldier and how they each have to go to the presidency. Lincoln had to go from being a politician to being commander-in-chief, mm -hmm. whereas... Grant went from a soldier to a politician. Mm -hmm. What are the difficulties each has, maybe in general and also specifically, that each have in going to something a bit alien to them? Well, Grant accepted the nomination for president. It was unanimous. There was no competitors. Believing that he was running and would govern as a kind of nonpartisan, he did not run in his own mind as the head of the Republican Party. But that changed after a year and a half or two. And he, once he was in the job, and once the Republican Party was struggling with the Democratic Party over the policies of Reconstruction, he stepped forward to say, I, I think I need to become the head of the Republican Party. And the Republican Party was fracturing the liberal Republicans, quote, unquote, it's a strange term. They didn't seem very liberal at that time, would run against him in 1872. So he stepped, he grew into this role, he stepped into this role. But yet, as you suggest, it was not something that was natural to him. In some ways, it was uncomfortable to him. But he had the temperament to be able to do this? Well, he had the temperament. Uh, he was a good listener. I, I don't think he always did as much as he could to kind of build people around him who could then initiate the consensus that he wanted to build. Yeah, but, but he was he willing to get out of the White House and go up to Congress a few times, which... Uh, which I think did, you either can view that as meddling or you can say, no, I'm, I'm going to take the lead here and talk to people who don't agree with me. But he was also ready to get out of the presidency and not do a third term, even though Julio probably would have stayed. She would have stayed. Uh, he, was, he was worn down by it. But I argue strongly in my biography that uh, the whole issue, we know the term today of voter suppression, uh, to me, the whole actions of the white leaguers and the Ku Klux Klan was to, to suppress the uh, African-American vote. And as his own Republican Party was retreating from Reconstruction, he stepped forward to prosecute the Klan, recognizing that local and state courts wouldn't even follow through on this. He was willing to use the power of the presidency and the power of the army to do what he felt was right. Uh, here is uh, Tom. Uh, from St. Louis, an AP U.S. history teacher. Uh, he asked, why did Grant fight against the Ku Klux Klan? Was this decision influenced by his time in St. Louis when he owned and worked with slaves? Was it influenced by his vision of federal authority? It's a great question, Tom. I, I, I have great questions yeah, from our listeners. It's a great question. Our watchers. Even though born into an anti-slavery family, I believe he was really not fundamentally anti-slavery until the experience of the war as he went further and further south he grew 
to see slavery and hated slavery. And then as he watched the Confederacy after the war change to kind of opposition to the, the Reconstruction measures, he stepped forward, first of all hoping he could win the, the, the day by the ballot. Mm -hmm. And when he saw that the Ku Klux Klan was leading a, a vicious assault against the ballot, they did not want African Americans to vote. They targeted political officials. He stepped forward to fight the Klan and to prosecute them. And I think this is one of the high water marks of his whole presidency. So, and, and even as his own party was disappearing on this issue, this is why he fought the Klan. I don't know that you can go back, Tom, to too many of his earlier experiences. I think they were his experiences that grew with him during the Reconstruction period. Well, he certainly had a uh, slap in the face of slavery yes. when he got married. Yeah, absolutely. And he was given, through his wife, right. a slave. Slave. He did manumit a slave in 1859, William. He signed manumission papers when he probably could have received $1,000 for a healthy male slave. He never comments on that, but he did, took that action, and that, that yeah, was very that powerful. There. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Chuck from Mississippi uh, asked this question. It seems that Grant's place in our history of Reconstruction has been greatly overlooked and underappreciated, positively, as we're early in, learning in this book. While trying to mend a broken and divided nation, he attempted to further civil rights and equality for African Americans. We were just talking about this. What is your assessment of his efforts and his place in history in this regard? I think you've just spoken to that, really. Well, during Reconstruction, uh, when Lincoln was assassinated, Grant tried mightily for a while to work with Andrew Johnson. He had a deferential attitude towards political civil leadership. But then when he saw what Johnson's true colors were, he was willing to step forward both as general in chief and then for a while he was secretary of war. And he, I think you're absolutely correct, Chuck, that his role in reconstruction before he's president, even in those three and a half years, very important and we need to understand that that becomes the preamble to what he will do as president. Well then let me ask you about a, a famous uh, African American at the time, Frederick Douglass. Yes. He must have had an assessment of Grant during the president, uh, uh, during the war time and certainly had an assessment of Lincoln during wartime. How did that assessment change after the, after the war for Grant and also with Lincoln for that matter? But give us a, a dual assessment of Douglas with Lincoln and Grant and how he felt about them. Well, Douglas was very appreciative of, of Lincoln during the war. He met him two times, very appreciative of the second inaugural address. When Douglas gives the famous address in 1876 when they uh, inaugurate or in, uh, dedicate the Freedmen's Monument in Washington, he kind of gives a mixed story of Lincoln. That he, he was the white man's president. However, there was no mixed story about Grant. He campaigned for Grant in 1868. He campaigned for Grant in 1872. I say in my uh, biography, and maybe I will simply read this, this is what Frederick Douglass said at the time of Grant's death. In him the Negro found a protector, the Indian a friend, a vanquished foe a brother, an imperiled nation a savior. Absolutely unequivocal. When Grant did his own probably misbegotten adventure to try to annex Santa Domingo, and finally the Congress said, well, you're will we're willing to let you send a commission to investigate whether or not this is a good idea, he appointed uh, Frederick Douglass to be the secretary to the commission. So Douglass had a very, very positive view of Grant. I'm going to put you to work if you have a pen. Okay, Otherwise sure. Otherwise we'll get one. Sure, I've got a pen. Uh, because people are asking for your book yeah, yeah. and uh, we want to be able to give it to them and they can see the book being signed. And meanwhile, uh, I'll talk a little bit about Author's Voice and what's coming up yes. uh, in the weeks ahead. And of course, if you go to authorsvoice.net, where you are now, you will see the shows that are coming up. Uh, and a host divided, remember we're a network, a virtual network of book signing shows, and this is a house divided. So on Saturday, October 29th at noon, Central Time, Pete Cousins will be coming with his new book, Earth is Weeping. This is about the uh, Indian Wars west of the Mississippi, the epic story of the Indian Wars for the American West. He has done some wonderful work, Pete Cousins. He came into 
my shop as a 15-year-old pitcher, and all of a sudden he has tons of books uh, after him, and he's had a great career in this, and he's worked on uh, kind of a battles and leaders of the Indian Wars before this. This is an important book that from an important author on the Indian Wars that you're not going to, going to miss. I don't have a book to show you about this, but uh, with him will be Tim Smith, uh, Grant Invades Tennessee. Is that, am I right about that? No. No, I'm, that's going to be November, I'm sorry. Tim Smith with Grant Invades Tennessee and David Powell, the Chickamauga Campaign. That's coming in November. Take a look at uh, uh, Nations uh, House Divided on your web and you'll see when they come in. Noah Andre Trudeau I've talked about. Lincoln's Greatest Journey uh, is coming in. And I think you're going to want to see this book because it elides with these others. And it's fascinating to see Trudeau's take on what's happening at the City Point Conference. And I'm also going to say that since you're here at Author's Voice and there are other shows to go to, here are two of the uh, children's books that we've done, uh, President Squid and I Am Drums. And these are wonderful books that we've already had the authors on Author's Voice on Lady Bird and Friends. And Elizabeth Bird from here in Evanston at Southside Chicago is a spectacular host for these, and I think you will enjoy these half-hour shows where the authors also read to your children, bring them in when they read parts of these books. I think they will enjoy it. They'll enjoy collecting signed books of authors that they enjoy reading and having read to them. And I think these are two that certainly would fit that and will introduce you to Lady Bird and Friends, Betsy Bird, and how she is doing her shows. I think these are enjoyable books, and certainly President Squid is right here, au courant. Now, I happen to know that you like a particular photograph of yes. Grant, and this is it. Uh, there are many photographs taken of him. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about this one very quickly, and also maybe one or two others that you like uh, as well that really show the essence of the man. Well, you need, need almost to compare this to other photographs where there's a sense of sort of self-importance. There's a solidity here of this photo. There's a sort of a s strong sense here, but there's no sense of self-importance. This is simply Grant posing for this photograph. I think it captures the person, uh, not a lot of braid on him. Uh, he often wore a private's uniform, and with the stars on his shoulders would be the only designation of who he is. I think this is probably the iconic folder that we, fo photo that we have of Grant. There's one of him very much like this, but inside a photo studio, wearing a mourning band That's for right. Lincoln. That's right, for Willie Lincoln. Yeah. Oh, oh, no, for, for Abraham for, Lincoln. For Abraham Lincoln yeah. afterwards. And yeah. it's very similar. I think yes. it's the same sort of feel that you right. just said for this book right. that I would say for that. Ron, we could go on, but <laughs> people should be reading this book. And that's how they're going to hear about other things, is leadership. Mm -hmm. What really happened in Mexico. I'll try to do this again. And so here it is, uh, American Ulysses, A Life of Ulysses S. Grant, first editions, signed. I think you're going to enjoy them. And while you're on the website, take a look at some of the others that we've done in A House Divided and also the other shows, part of Author's Voice. We certainly appreciate Thank that you, you, were, you brought yourself in, and I'm going to say that, that the publisher should have, I'm going to say that right there, the <laughs> publisher should have brought you in, but you did it yourself to, to promote a book that is already on Oprah's top 10 to read this fall mm -hmm. and is already on the New York Times bestseller list in the top 10. So congratulations for that. Thanks very much. My Thank pleasure. You. Thank you for the staff of the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop and author's voice. We appreciate your being here. We have an audience out there as well. Good to see you, Dave and Wendy, and Dave, and uh, a new friend. Thank you all for being here. And for you watching, come back again. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>